Okay, well, welcome. I'm going to be recording some of this today so that I can post this on YouTube. And my little iPad here is recording what I'm saying, and it's recording everything that's up on the screen for you to go back and record. Uh, what we've done so far is we just went over the syllabus, right, really quick about what you need to purchase in the classroom or in the bookstore. Uh, let me now point you to some of the online resources and help you get started. Those especially who have not tried this at all, please try this. If you've run into a problem, we'll try to diagnose it tonight. Or like I said, we'll work on getting some clarity from Pearson about some of the issues that are going on. Um, in the syllabus, if you just read down in the fine print on the front page, it says how to register for Mastering AMP. Now there's actually two different ways to do this. Uh, the card um, gave you some instructions. I gave you some basic instructions here. And here is another way. And maybe this will solve some of the problems. So is everyone OK with Blackboard? OK, I'm going to talk to my computer here for a second. But if you're OK with Blackboard, and I'm in the course right now. Is everyone OK with going into Blackboard, into our course? Over on the side, you're going to see a tab for lecture materials. OK, and everything related to lecture will be there. There will be a file of YouTube videos. This will be one of them. Uh, after today, after tonight, I will upload this to YouTube. I'll give you the link. You can go into that folder, click on the link, and you'll hear exactly what you're seeing and hearing right now as a review if you wanted to hear any of this again. Mastering AMP, I'm going to click on that in a second. Um, all lab-related materials are here, OK? So that's pretty standard-looking uh, Blackboard site. And everything you need for lab or lecture, de de doesn't matter who your lab instructor is. It doesn't matter if you're regular or hybrid. Everything you need is on this site, and it's found in one of those two major places. Now, the easiest way that I know to register for, for um, mastering is to <coughs> simply click on Mastering AMP. Now, I can't do this because I'm already, I'm already in there. But if you click on Mastering AMP, it should bring you to a login section, OK? And it's going to say, go down to my Mastering AMP course home. Again, I can't replicate what you see, unfortunately. I can't do it again. But there should be a, a link here that says, go to your course home or something like that. When you click on that, that's when it's going to ask you for your name and your address and your school. And then it's going to ask you to put in that 16 or 20 letter code, right? And that's only specific to you. you that's what you bought in the bookstore. That code is valid for two years. When you register your name and you send Pearson your, your uh, uh, password and username and your email address, not your, when you send your, your, your email address, you're now connected to that code. And you now have a 24-month subscription to this program. It'll be valid for next semester, for 106. If you don't take 106 for another year, it'll still be good, right? As long as you finish this sequence up in the next 24 months, you'll have that access. When you do this, it should not ask you for the course ID number because the link, the course ID is already linked to Blackboard. And this is where some of the issues are that seem to be going on in the class. And we'll get to the bottom of that. But if you do need, for some reason, the course ID, it's here in bold on the form, Macaulay 86783. Okay, so if, they, if someone asks you or asks for a course ID, it's my name with those, six, or those five numbers. Okay? You'll go in here and then, once you are in mastering, this is what you are going to see once you get registered. It's going to pull up a calendar-like program. And the first thing you're going to see is a calendar. On that calendar, there are assignments. Okay, And right here, on Friday, I had, and I'll, and I'll hold this to, unless we can't get this fixed quickly, I'll hold this to you. This introduction assignment, it's only three questions. It's really, really quick. It's basically click on it, learn a little bit about mastering, and learn how to navigate around mastering. It's a, it's a tutorial on how to use the program. I like, and if I have you all do it by Friday, that will necessitate you all get enrolled. Okay, do it quickly. If you financial aid hasn't come in, if the pocketbook isn't deep enough right now, as I mentioned, as you're registering, if you haven't purchased the code, you can sign up for a two-week free trial. So there's no, you know, hopefully 
within 10 days, two weeks, you would have the money or financial aid, whatever, to get your materials. So you should be able to go in there regardless if you have the funds or the key or not and just get enrolled in mastering, okay? We just got to figure out what's going wrong, wrong with the uh, getting in there. There'll be other assignments. This is a uh, chapter one assignment on some questions. And then you'll see there's a quiz coming way down on the 27th. That's a due date. That's an end due date. These are all, say, these are deadlines, okay? So you can do it before then. But that'll be the quiz that's going to help you get ready for the first exam, which is on the 29th. By the 29th, that's our first exam day, you should have completed the two homework assignments on mastering. Okay? So there are homework assignments, there's a quiz, and there are these other module activities to help you become familiar with the material. Okay? Those are deadlines on the calendar. They'll open up to you before that, and you'll have usually a week or so to complete any of those activities. So those days right there, that's the exact date when it's due? Yes. Every, so that quiz, we're having a quiz on that day? Yeah, well, it's due. If we uh, click on it, online. what you're going to see, okay. yeah, this is, this is all online. Okay. If, you've, if you click on this, you're going to see in the fine details, and you'll see this, this particular quiz is due at... 10.59 p.m., okay, 11 o'clock at night, on that day, the 27th. Your first exam, as you look at the calendar in a moment, the first exam is on Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday, depending upon what section you're in, the 28th or the 29th, okay? So that quiz will be due before the exam. So all okay. that stuff is online stuff? This is all online stuff, absolutely. So the, this is mastering, right? This is the online resources for the course. Now, watch my, watch my little moving thing. There's a lot more to this program than just this little calendar and these activities. On the upper left, I have not posted the syllabus here. You have it in your hand. I'm just not going to post it there. Below it, assignments. You can click on it there, and rather than showing you a calendar, it'll show you a list of assignments. It's the same thing in a different way of looking at it. You don't need to worry about your scores. That'd be your personal scores on it. I want to go down here, e-text. Click on the e-text. What's nice about this is that you now have access to the entire textbook on your tablet or your computer. So if you're traveling someplace and you don't want to have your book with you or whatever else, oops, if I had the right plug-in, um, you would be able to come in here. I'll find out what, what's going on with that. But you'd be able to get now the entire textbook, OK? And it's all be there for you. Um, if you're having trouble like I just did, this computer's not updated for something, if you go up to help and support right here, you just hit that help and support button up here, the very first thing that pops up, supported browsers and plugins, click on that and it will give you a quick assessment. Check your browser and it will tell me that I'm up to date on most everything. If there was something that I wasn't up to date with, it would tell me how to get it. In fact, it's telling me that my Firefox is a little bit old that's on this computer. So then it would give you the opportunity to upload the more recent version of Firefox. They will keep up with the technology, and they will expect you to keep up with the browsers and things in the background. So if anything is ever not working right, just check that little help sign. It'll do a quick uh, perusal of your computer and let you know if you're missing something so you can interact with the program in its entirety. OK. Um, Study area, this is the big one. Your lab instructor and I will keep talking about this, but you click on study area, and this brings you now to an entire suite of activities connected to our textbook. Okay. So this is the whole suite of materials for the Pearson Visual Anatomy and Physiology book. It's broken up by chapter. So this is what's available to you just for chapter one. Chapter one, right here in the bar. So chapter one. Right? There is, there's a link to the e-text. Here are uh, a pretest. If you want to take a pretest and just kind of see how you're doing, here are a bunch of uh, practice sessions and quizzes. Here are some other activities you could do. There's just so much on here that you could be working on to help you with this. Let me go down, for example, chapter two. So go to chapter two. We'll be on that soon enough. Go to go. And now you've got, again, uh, you know, pretests and activities and labeling activities, all sorts of things. Up here on the, right, on the left-hand side, there's a study guide. 
There's a pretest, there's a quiz, there are activities, there's a post-test, there's all sorts of practice, right? Mastering. Play with it, practice it, master the material. The things you have to do will be the assignments on mastering. The things you will have to do will be the pre-lab activities that you'll learn about in lab. The things you'll have to do will be the quiz. But there's a lot of other stuff. And I need you to individually start exploring. Click around. Find two or three other tools within this library and use them in preparation for the first exam. Maybe look at the pre-test. Maybe look at the practice problems. Maybe um, work with a study partner, whatever. But I want you to get familiar with this. Click around. Look what's here. Use it to supplement okay, what I'm talking about in lecture. And stick to it. Make a schedule. Do that religiously for the next couple of weeks until we get to first exam. Take the first exam. See how well that preparation served you. If you find that that did not serve you as well as it could have, let's talk. Let's make another plan. Okay? But find two or three of those resources, commit to them, look at them, find them, and over the next couple of weeks, study them. There are other things down through here, like AP Flicks and Bone Dissection videos and PAL 3.0. There are other things that I will be pointing you to throughout the semester that you'll be told to go and do as well. So once you get into mastering, right, once you get enrolled, go into mastering, look at this. You'll find all of these resources in there for you. This is available for you 24-7. Okay, so that's mastering. Um, now, one more thing, going back to the course, go back to your syllabus. You read in an announcement that I sent you about the My Readiness Test. This is completely separate from mastering. And in the instructions I sent you, I told you to go to My Readiness Test dot com. And again, it's going to ask you to register as a student. Okay, different registration. Just do it all over again. For this, this is in the fine print of page two of the syllabus, down in the very small print, under number four. So the diagnostic pretest will be completed within the first week of class. It's due no later than this Sunday. We can get everything worked out. For this, log into myreadinesstest.com, proceed with the code or with the registration. And this, WSS, MPT, thread, buoy, so that, that thing, that's a code you'll need when it asks for it. And then that program ID, XL1R. That's another code you'll need when you're doing that. That's that one hour, 70 question pre-diagnostic quiz that I'm asking each of you to do. And I'm hoping that we can all get that done by the end of the week. Now, who has already done that? Yay. Who has tried and had trouble? OK, I'm trying to figure out why that is. Who knows not what I'm talking about. There's a few more of you, right? right? So a lot of you have done it. Thank you. And so I know it's working. There's just an issue, right? There's something that bugged out, and I'll get it figured out. And uh, your grade, just so you know, if you didn't score very well on it, it's not going to hurt you. You're going to get points for doing the quiz. Okay? You're going to get full credit. So I'm not going to give you 40% uh, on that quiz grade if you only got 40% of it. It's just a tool for me to use. The 10 points you get will be the, the, the reward you get for doing that quiz. So I'll get that figured out, and I'll get an email out again as to why that's giving us trouble. Yes, ma'am. Three hundred and fifty students can take the test, so yeah, I don't know why. There's something, uh, right? No, something. Because I, I hadn't purchased my book yet, so then I. Nope. It doesn't matter about your books. You don't need a mastering oh. code. It's a totally separate little beast over there in the corner, all on its own. And I've got emails in. We'll figure it out. Do this for me. Uh, if you did have trouble, sometimes it's simple as changing browsers. It sounds silly. I don't understand why. If you're using Firefox, jump over and do use IE or use Chrome. Just see. Just entertain me. Just see if maybe that doesn't do the trick. Sometimes it's that simple. I don't understand why that is. Okay. Same thing with the mastering thing. You might have something in your cookies, whatever that means, and it's, <laughs> it's hanging out there, and you've got to cleanse your cookies or whatever that means, and, or start over. So try it. Don't go, don't go nutty. Try it a couple more times. If it still doesn't work, just be looking for that clarification email from me for those who are having trouble with that. 
So does that help make sense a little bit, just a little bit? Um, in the lecture, let me, let me get going with a little bit about the lecture and what to expect. And then some of you are just visiting to kind of get oriented, and I'll let you go in about 10 or 15 minutes, okay, if you've heard all you need to hear. And then I'll start lecturing for lecture one. But let me continue on with the syllabus, just a few more things, and make sure we're all on the same page here. So we've talked about uh, the grading scale. We've got our points figured out. Laboratory, I'm not going to talk about that now. That's a lab thing. <clears throat> just know it's important. You've got to be there. You'll hear about that in lab. Uh, the rest of it, the next couple pages, are the contractile, you know, language that's in every one of your syllabi. I do want to emphasize, however, that we have tremendous tools available for you. In a moment, probably somebody from the testing center is going to come in and interrupt me and tell you about tutoring. But I want to just go ahead and tell you right now. We've got phenomenal resources available to you. Across the hallway from the lab, in room 249, it's what we call the biology resource room. It's not a very fancy place. The new building, it's going to be cool. But we have this space identified. That's where we have walk-in tutors. We have about 30 hours of student peer tutors who are sitting in that room waiting for you to come and ask questions. All of them have had me for this lecture. All of them know my tricks and my, my weird ways. They can help you. Okay? That schedule of their availability will be out in the next day or so. They're, they're there. They're there like Monday through Friday, most of the days. It's amazing how many hours we have covered for that. In addition to that, there's one-on-one -on -one tutoring that you can sign up for through the tutoring center. Okay, so if you think you might need some extra help, there's a lot of options. One, plan on stopping in to see the walk-in tutors. Schedule your own one-on-one -on -one tutoring session. Join with your lab people and create a small study group. There it takes a village, right? This is not something, you can do this as a Lone Ranger on your own, but I'll tell you what, this is a whole lot more approachable and easier and more fun, honestly, if you've got somebody to, to banter off. So find three or four other people um, and identify yourself. Find a time where you all can meet together. That room upstairs is open as early as 7 o'clock in the morning when our lab manager, Jennifer, comes on staff. And it's open until 9 o'clock at night. As long as there's a lab going on in the hallway, that room's open. So you've got 14 hours a day to walk in that room. That room has microscopes, overhead projectors. It has models, books, all sorts of resources for you to learn from. Computers, you can be doing your mastering assignments in there. It's a great little place to hang out. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know about that. I want you to take advantage of all of those things. That's all in addition to my office hours that are on the other page. Um, accreditation, email, behavior, all that stuff, all pretty straightforward stuff. I'll respect you, you respect me, we'll get along just splendidly. Uh, keep on going. Just a couple more things. Notes about lectures, I'm over on page six. If you're in the hybrid section, just know that I'm going to, um, I've already recorded the lectures. Okay? If you go on Blackboard, if you go on Blackboard, Under right here, YouTube lecture links. I have posted my lectures, the entire collection of them, from last summer and last fall. They're complete. This semester, I'm teaching a 106 section, and I'm going to be focusing on re-recording those lectures for that group. So in essence, the 105, the people who are in hybrid, you can Wait until we've gotten there. You can actually look ahead a little bit. But if you look in here, lecture one, there's the lab one presentation. Lecture two, lecture three, lecture four. They're all here for you. Just kind of drop and just grab this, grab this little uh, URL address, okay? Drop it into your browser. It'll bring you to YouTube. You'll hear me. You'll see everything that I said or circled on the presentation. Don't get behind, okay? If you are officially in hybrid and you find, you know what, I'm not being as disciplined as I thought I should be, and I really need to start coming to lecture, you know where to come. Come here, come tomorrow morning at 10.10. Okay, you're always welcome to come into a regular lecture if you're in the hybrid section. And then some of you who are in the regular section may say, I kind of like the idea of listening to the lecture at home. And so I may just do the hybrid thing. So it's up to you, it's very fluid. I, I, I still think though, that there's a certain amount of discipline necessary to be successful as a hybrid student. And if that's not you, and you'll find out soon enough, then coming to lecture is always an option for you. And I encourage you to be here. 
It's not, it's not that this is a magical time, but committing to being here, something happens. There's a few extra neurons that fire being here and, and focusing while you're here. So I will record some of the lectures. I'm just not going to promise right now that I'm going to record every single lecture once again. These two sets of lectures are essentially identical and go through the same content that you have for this semester. Okay, so you're not going to be missing anything significantly. If anything changes, I'll let you know for sure. Okay? So that's how you want to approach the lecture. So you're either going to be here, page 6, or listen to the lectures as soon as possible. The textbook, it's easy to read. It really is as easy as one can make anatomy and physiology. Use it. Open it. Crack the spine on this thing. Use the book. There is a lot of material. I can't change the fact that the good Lord made us quite complex. And there's a lot of pieces and parts to us and a lot of moving parts and a lot of things to understand. There will be some things that I will say and some people will get it and some people won't. You're going to have to go back and listen to it, study it, digest it. And that's going to require reading the book, listening back to the lectures. Um, there will be um, six exams. The schedule's on here. I'll go over that in a moment. Only documented extreme situations will warrant a makeup exam. And all makeup exams will be at the end of the semester. Okay, so if you miss an exam, the makeup will be at the end of the semester. The exams will be um, multiple choice, fill in the blank, short answer. There'll be a combination of things. I'll tell you more about that as we get closer. Um, moving on down, attendance policy. I'm not taking your attendance in lecture. Lab, absolutely. In lecture, no. Okay, you're adults. I hope you'll be here. I think you'll find it useful to be here. But I won't be taking attendance nor giving you extra credit for being here. Um, students with disabilities, if any of you have a diagnosed disability, I encourage you to talk with the people in room 101, and they can work out reasonable accommodations, and they'll let me know about that in confidence. So if you know of any issue uh, in the past, then please talk with them. Even if you were identified in the past, you have to reestablish that relationship with them semester after semester. Okay? And then everything else in the bottom is just come to class or listen to the lectures and just think. Think about what I'm saying. Dive in. Um, I'll go over the note packs with you in a moment. And then let's go over the calendar. Okay, looking over the next page, page 7. I've got lectures on Monday and I have lectures on Tuesday. So that's why it says uh, MT, Monday, Tuesday. Okay, so today and tomorrow, uh, January 12th and 13th, I'll be covering the introduction to the course, what I'm doing right now, yeah. and a little bit about the human body. This is material from Chapter 1 in your Martini textbook. On Wednesday or Thursday, I'll be discussing probably finishing up a little bit of chapter one and moving on to the chemistry chapter two section. Next Monday, there is no class because of MLK day. And so this lecture will be, I probably will post that one. And all of you on Monday will be listening to the lecture online for sure to get on sequence. I can't get off that, I can't get off that much of a schedule. So the Monday folks will listen to that lecture definitely online and we'll be then caught up with the Tuesday group, okay? And then we'll proceed through the rest of the semester. The first exam will be for you guys Wednesday or Thursday, uh, the 28th or the 29th. Hybrid students, you have the option of taking it on either of those days in the testing center, okay? So for the students who are in the hybrid section, you will go on to My MCC. And at the very top of My MCC, there is a link Under t -t 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 student services, right here, go down to testing center, and right here, book your test. Okay, you'll click on that, you'll fill out a little bit of information. They will, if they haven't already, have those six exam dates for my biology 105 class, and you will sign up to take it on either the Wednesday or the Thursday. Okay, there's a few rules that they have you have to book online. Uh, you have to finish 15 minutes before the end. You'll have the same hour and 30 minutes that everyone else will have. It's the same environment, same exam. Everything's the same, except if you're in the hybrid section, you'll be taking the exam in the testing center on either of those days, flexibility around your schedule. If you're normally in this class, if this is your normal class, you'll take the exam now at 4.30 on that day. Okay, or if you're in the Tuesday section, you'll take it at that time. So the hybrid students get a little bit of flexibility because they're a little bit more flexible, okay? And that brings us through the end of the semester. The final exam has not yet been posted, but 
that exam six will just be another unit exam. It is not a cumulative exam. Okay. I'm almost done for those students who have to leave, uh, who came in just for the hybrid presentation, the orientation. Um, are there any questions right now about resources, things to get, what to buy in the bookstore, anything like that? Okay, so you're looking for this book, Visual Anatomy and Physiology. Uh, this is the lab book. This is the fetal pig book that comes with that uh, Amerman book for the later in the course. I need to change this picture. You have a different lab atlas that came this semester. And then you also have this program called PAL 3.0 that came with your mastering stuff. Yes, sir? Question? Um, for that mastering A and B, I just go to course home and put in the code? It should lead you through some, it should lead you through some uh, registration questions. Oh, okay. So okay. Just take me back to my blackboard. Maybe it'll work on it. Maybe so. Okay. Yes, sir. Is the lecture text with the visual anatomy? Yes. Is that a new textbook for this semester? It, we started this textbook uh, last fall. So last summer it was a different book. 2014. Yes. Okay. It's a new book as of 2014. Yes, ma'am. Are we um, the next No, this is mastering is instead of connect. Connect is the old program we used to use. Now we're using mastering. It's a similar online resources. So do they still have like the little card thing for this That same idea. There's going to be an access card. And we have their access card for, you're going to have a code, a little cardboard box in there. So that we're not going to mastering on the, um, yes. oh, it's a different code. So we may have solved this problem. Okay. <laughs> we may have figured this one out, right? <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll work with you after class, OK? We'll get this figured out. OK. A um, couple of things. You can also go to this site, Mastering AMP. That will also bring you into, like I said, getting registered. Um, I will be in this course, in addition to all the anatomy and physiology, I will be expecting you to learn the meanings of about 500 different prefixes and suffixes, words that are important for anatomy and understanding biology and, and getting started in this journey. And I'll be going over that with you and we'll get started with that today. And on the syllabus, the dates for the exams are not going to change. Unless there's some horrible ice storm, unless you know something horrible happens, those dates are fixed. So you can count on, with great confidence, those dates being the exam days. Go ahead and put those on your master calendar and know that those days are going to happen. Okay? Um, yes, questions? Uh, there was one book in the bookstore that said it wasn't required, but it was recommended. It was like a visual. Yep, visual book. Don't worry about that one. There's a book in there that the bookstore has put in there. I like it. Oh, it's a lovely book, right? I love it. It's a lovely book, but you, if you, if after, it'll be there in three months, or two months, right? A month. If after you've done everything we have for you here, you feel like I still need more to do, we can talk, okay. right? But I would not go buy that book right now. You have plenty of resources at your fingertips now. What does that one look like? It's like it's pink and like white. the bat and the giraffe vertebra. Okay. Okay. Kind of orangey yellow front. You can bring it back. I actually put it on there, so I figured that's the one I needed to. You can bring that back if, if you I need to. It. Okay. <laughs> they, should still, they should still help you. Okay, anything else? Anything else? Code-wise, I'll get the messages. Any other resource questions? Okay, now. Crack open your lecture supplement. Let me tell you what's in here, and then I'll start talking, and some of you can leave after I introduce what's in this. In your light blue covered lecture supplement. First thing you're going to find is a page that says Darley's suggestions, right? Very, very first page, Darley's suggestions. Study suggestions for introductory biology courses. Now, I have lost track of who Darley is. The last link I can find for this person is someone who's at the University of Georgia. Okay, But I found this little thing a couple years ago, and I think it is, I think it's worthwhile for you to read through that little page. It's just a page on the front, page on the back. 
It's going to give you some ideas about how to be successful in an introductory biology, biology course. And it talks about active versus passive learning. Maybe you've heard about those types of things before. I'm not going to read this to you. Read it. It's a quick read. It's easy read. On the back, it says at the bottom, having read this, what are a couple of things I may try to do this semester, right? So things that I will try to do this semester have, having read through this. I think it's worth reading, especially some of you are a little bit nervous. You know, maybe it's been a while since you've been in school. Maybe it's been a while since you've been in a biology course or an anatomy course. And you've certainly heard horrible things about me in this course, right? <laughs> and, and so you know you've got some work ahead of you, and you're a little bit apprehensive about how to get started. I'm throwing all this information at you with all these online resources, and you're like, how do I get started? What do I do? What? Just hold my hand and tell me what to do next, OK? So number one, get onto Blackboard, click around lab and lecture folders, become familiar. Number two, get into mastering. If there's problems, we'll get them solved. Click around, find out what's there. Come back and ask me questions on Wednesday or in lab this week if I see you about things you're having concerns about or email me if you are not quite sure how to proceed. I think once we get going, you'll be OK. Just want to share a little bit about myself as well. Um, just as a quick introduction, we never seem to have time for this kind of stuff. But I have my uh, master's degree and PhD, both from the University of Florida, College of Medicine. Uh, my PhD was in medical res uh, research and medical sciences, which basically means that I'm really broadly trained in like biochemistry and genetics and molecular biology and all those wonderful areas, anatomy and physiology as well. And um, after I finished my doctorate, my wife also received her doctorate in uh, speech pathology and neuropsychology. She is a professor at Grand Valley. Uh, she is a graduate coordinator for the speech pathology program. If any of you are thinking about pursuing that field, you'll definitely be talking with my wife in the future. Uh, that's a master's program and an undergraduate program at Grand Valley. After we finished our doctorates at University of Florida, we headed about as far away as we could. We went up to Spokane, Washington, uh, to Washington State University. That was my first faculty position in the Department of Genetics and Cell Biology. My wife was a professor there as well. Uh, then we had a few little bumps in the road that I'll share with you as we go along through the course. Uh, we ended up at the University of Alabama. Uh, we were roll tied for about five and a half years and lived there and loved Alabama completely. And then I got called over to Oklahoma Wesleyan University. So I was over in Oklahoma for a couple of years. And then finally, we've been up here in Michigan. This is now our seventh year. I, I measure our time here because we had a child born two weeks after we moved here. So um, we have a seven-year-old. So I know how, old, how long we've been suffering through Michigan winters. Um, <laughs> he's our fifth and final child. And, um, but we have five kids. I've got one who just finished the nursing program here at um, MCC is pursuing her bachelor's degree at, at um, Grand Valley and is starting at the Helen DeVos NICU, uh, neonatal intensive unit, Yay. next month. So she's got a great job uh, <clears throat> through the nursing program. I have another daughter who is pre-med at Grand Valley and wants to go into anesthesiology. I have a son who's 16 and a junior in high school. He's my jock. He's my big football player, wants to play D1, D2 football. Um, I've got a 12-year-old. We're not quite sure what he's going to do yet. And I have my seven-year-old who's in first grade and is doing Chinese immersion in our school system over in Grand Rapids. Um, I live in Grand Rapids. I make the commute. So I understand you know, a little bit about weather, travel sometimes. And um, I really do enjoy what I do. So if you have any questions at all about, you know, what do I do with this field or what are some options in the future, if you're not quite sure about your academic goals, talk with me. Let's, let's sit down. Let's talk about some things. Um, and let's figure out what, what the best path is for you. But I really want you to know my door is open, and I really want to help you be successful in anything that uh, you're being called into. A lot of you have a lot of years ahead of, ahead of school for you, and let's make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, for those who need to go, if you need to go, you're welcome to go. If you want to hang around for a few more minutes, that's fine. I just don't want you to feel obligated. Those who are here just for the hybrid orientation, and uh, I'm just going to continue to go through these PowerPoint slides, and you'll be able to listen to all this online as you pull up those YouTube videos. Thank you for coming. See you all. OK. So some students say, you know, well, how do I get going? How do I be successful in a course like this? There's a few tips. I, I ripped all this off from online somewhere. And um, 
you know, because I have students who say, help me, help me, help me. I'm not sure how to get started. So there's some little tips in here. Some of them will apply to you personally. Some of them you say, you know, I've got that figured out. Or maybe there'll be some new ideas on here that you never thought about. I think they're pretty darn basic. But then again, you know, I was in college for 14 years. It took me a long time to figure this out, right? It's hard for me to believe that, but I was in university longer than I was in kindergarten through 12th grade. Kind of crazy, <laughs> right? So uh, maybe I'm just really, really slow. Right? So I have, to, I have to do this, OK? So number one, show up. Right? I really do think, like I said, there's something important about committing yourself to being here. And if that doesn't work, occasionally watch the YouTube video. But I really don't think that should become your priority unless you're choosing to go hybrid. And that's a different, you know, a different animal. Number two, budget your time. You, you, you know, the thing about community college students that I think is extra stressful is that most of you are not just going to school, right? Most of you are a little bit older than traditional, not all of you, but some of you are a little bit older. You've got a job. You may have a family. You're trying to, you know, juggle all of that stuff. Or maybe you're just coming out of high school and you think you're busy, but you're really not busy yet. But you're still, everyone's trying to juggle stuff, right? And that's a little bit different from the, quote, traditional four-year student who's sitting over in a residence hall at Grand Valley who, you know, it's just a little bit different lifestyle, right? They don't have as many jobs and as many distractions usually as a community college student. So you need to budget your time. You need to lay out your map. You need to figure out, when am I in class? When am I going to study? When are you going to sleep? That's not optional. When are you going to eat and, and exercise regularly? I need to work on that one, okay? So we all have things that we need to work with, but please budget your time, develop a schedule. Um, Anticipate deadlines. This is the big one. I hope I won't get too many of these emails, but I'll get an email, Dr. McCauley, I didn't know that we had a test tomorrow. I didn't know that there was an online quiz due yesterday. I, I guess I just didn't notice it. Well, the whole month of January is on that calendar. right? You see it right now. It, it, it's not going to change. And a lot of this anticipating what's coming up is a big problem. You can be an okay student, but as long as you stay on top of the deadlines and do all that you're supposed to do, it will really, really help you. I've seen brilliant students do poorly in the class because they just can't, I don't know, keep up with the schedule, right? So there's a combination of brilliance and just doing it day by day, getting into the routine, meeting all the deadlines, showing up to lab, doing the pre-labs, doing the work that you need to do. So get into a, get into a rhythm, okay? Um, find a quiet place to study. Some of you need noise, but the library has study cubicles. Um, there are other places around campus. If you've got a two-hour break between lectures, don't just go to the bistro and eat for two hours, right? Make some of that time useful and study. Try to find somebody to study with. I'm not going to read this to you. I'm just going to get some ideas off this. Um, what else? Be a good reader. This book that we've gotten for you, this visual anatomy book, it's, again, chopped up into small sections. You won't have these long, long things to read. Read the syllabus. The syllabus, I've been doing this class now for a few years. I'm going to have this class plus or minus five to 10 minutes at the end of the semester. I know what day it is. I know where I'm going to be. I know my timing. I got my rhythm down. So look at the calendar. Look at the syllabus. I assure you I will be plus or minus very little in that calendar. You know where we're going to be as we go through this course. If you see a term you don't know, look it up, right? Um, if you're using the e-textbook, you can click on the button, just like an e-reader, and it will tell you the definition. So don't glare over words you don't know. That's part of the learning process. As you're reading through each chapter, or the two-page spreads in the book are called modules, um, look at the titles. Look at the, the, the labels underneath the pictures. Don't just skip over big chunks of material. Sometimes those bold faced and italicized words are really, really important for you to look at. At the end of every chapter, there are chapter summaries. Look at them. They're brilliant. They're, they're very succinct. That's a place where you want to go to make sure you've got all the ideas. Read the charts. Read the legends. Um, read with the purpose. If I'm saying it, there must be some reason why I'm saying it. And try to ask yourself, why in the world is he talking about this stuff? So be an active listener. Try to plug in what I'm saying into the context of what we're discussing. There are two kinds of learners, what I've seen. Well, there are many kinds of learners. But there's some students who are really, really good at the detail. They can memorize details really, really well. 
but then they can't always tell me the whole story. There are some people who can kind of give me the big story gist, but they're not very good at the little details. Maybe you identify yourself as being one or more of those type of learners. You want to find a study partner who's the opposite, right? If you're going to pick a study partner, find one who learns in a slightly different way than you do. You want to be compatible, but you don't want to be both big picture people and both people who don't see the detail or vice versa. Find that person who complements your learning style. If I say it three times, it must be important. Okay, it's like the Bible. So just listen. If I say it, it just must be important. So think about why am I saying that and try to plug it into what you're learning. If there's time, ask questions. If, if your question is directly connected to what we're talking about, I'll do my best to address it. I don't know everything. I'll tell you the right off that I don't know. If um, your question's a little bit off to the side, I'll say, you know what, let's talk about that another time. But I do want you to feel comfortable discussing these things. This is the biggest class you're going to have at MCC. This is a big class for any community college at 60 students. So I, I want you to feel comfortable to raise your hand, even from the back, and ask a question, OK? Just don't let this big size um, throw you off. Uh, take some good notes. Now, I've given you all of the PowerPoint notes. And there are hundreds of educators in this country who would claim that by my giving you the notes, I've done the most horrible thing I could ever do to you. Okay? Because in the old days, right, when I did this, there weren't PowerPoints. Um, I had to sit there and scribble everything that my prof was writing on the board. Um, there might have been overhead projectors. Uh, I had classes with 750 students in them, so this would be a nice small gathering, uh, with a two-story overhead projector, and he's up there scribbling things. Um, and you had to go read the book and put together the notes and synthesize everything and pull it all together. Well, that's basically what I've done for you, right? These PowerPoint notes, I've taken the pictures, I've taken the words, I've pulled it all together and put it into a nice little package. So I've taken away one of the very important steps in your learning the material. Do not get stuck or, or don't get deceived to think that just coming to lecture, listening to my little PowerPoints and walking through them is the same as learning. That is what the Darley paper will talk about as being passive learning. And it's not great for long-term learning. You need to still dissect and dive into this material. Okay? So don't get stuck into thinking, if I just read through my PowerPoints, I'm going to be OK. You're going to have to do some more synthesis of the material. Okay? OK, so there's just a lot of things in here for you to look at. Um, you're not going to have time to recopy your notes, not a chance. But I definitely want you to look over your notes. Do me a favor, if you can at all in your personal schedule, before your head hits the pillow tonight, look over what we talked about today. Try to, before the end of the day of your lecture or your lab, to review the materials. There's something about the learning, right? We know the learning, uh, some things about learning. And if you will review what you did in the same day, it will help make some of those connections better than by waiting the next day. So if at all possible, sit down with your notes tonight, look over what we talked about today over what we did today. Form a study group, ask questions, right? all the good things that are up here. Preparing for exams. Exams are just a chance to show off. You shouldn't be stressed about an exam. I mean, I know you will be. I was too. But honestly, the best students I know are the ones who just are like, OK, I learned this last week. When we learned it last week, I studied it, I read it, I broke it down, I did all my work. I'm reviewing it before the exam. I'm going to go in and just show off what I learned, right? rather than stressing out and getting all worked up about it. So just try your very best to relax. Study hard as you're moving toward the exam. Don't wait to the night or two before the exam. That rarely works well. And just break it down day by day, and you'll be fine. And then just like I said, relax, 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 relax. So I want everyone to do really, really well in this class. Okay, On the first exam, on the 29th of February, or the 28th, I want you to go back and just think about these 13 little study skills on here. Just think about them. Nothing heavy. But definitely read through that Darley, that one-page article about um, how to approach a class like this. And there will be a couple of questions on the first exam related to the Darley paper. So definitely read through that first paper, the Darley paper. Any questions about how to be successful? What do you think? We're going to be OK? We're going to do really well this semester. I feel it. Um, I have an emphasis in my course on vocab. Now, 
there's about 100 slides. And if you open up your supplement, right, uh, there's the Darley page. Right after that, there's what's called the objectives, chapter one objectives. It's basically a study guide, right? Things that you should be looking through to learn about from chapters one, chapter two. It just kind of keeps going, doesn't it? Right? Those are all the chapters. After that, you come to a blue divider, and now there's some vocabulary slides, some PowerPoint slides, and some vocab prefixes and suffixes. I'm going to start with that right now. You're going to want to have that with you every time you come. Then after that, the next blue divider, you start seeing the PowerPoint content that I'll start talking about in a few minutes. Okay? So, right now, turn to the vocabulary portion of your PowerPoint package. I'm going to change slides. In every lecture, we're going to get started by going through about five of these slides, okay? Four or five of these slides every day. If you look on the syllabus, it tells you that on the first exam, it's going to cover chapters one and two. The material from lab one, when you're in your lab tonight or this week, listen carefully to your instructor because the PowerPoint that he or she is going to be presenting about body directions and terms and all that you're going to learn about will also be on exam one. And then finally, vocab one through 16. Right, it's on the syllabus, vocab one through 16. That means slides one through 16. Slides one through 16. I'm going to go through four of them right now, four of these slides. Each slide has four or five terms on it. The way you want to, I think, approach this is, is flashcards. Okay? The way that most people tell me has been successful for them is flashcards. About flashcards, they don't have to be fancy. right? Um, you can get a regular deck of flashcards and maybe cut them in half. You just need little tiny good stuff. You don't have to be big flashcards. There's not a lot to write on these. I don't recommend the ones on wire, okay, the ones that are on a wire binder, and I don't recommend the flashcards that are somehow bound together. I think it makes more sense to have them separated into like a deck of cards. You can put the ones you know on one side, the ones you don't know on the other side. Keep flashing through the stack until you know them all. If you will do the vocab nearly every day, it'll take you three minutes a day. When you get to the exam, you won't be stressing out at all about the vocab, okay? So you know right now that it's going to be slides 1 through 16. You know right now that the first exam is going to cover A, this first term, through zero, okay, meaning yellow. You could go ahead tonight or tomorrow this week, make up the flashcards for all of these first 16 slides of terms from A through zero. You don't have to wait for me to talk about it. Go ahead and make up those flashcards, start looking through them. There's nothing magical about it. They're set up alphabetically. And what you want to know, what you want to put on your flashcard is as follows. On one side of your flashcard, you want to put A dash. On the other side, put without or lacking. That's it. The example underneath it is simply an example. I'm not going to quiz you on that example. You just need to know that many words, for example, asymptomatic, without or lacking symptoms. Right? That's an example just to help you hang your hat on something, but you need to know that A means without or lacking. Secondly, AB, away from. Okay? AB, away from. You may see that in the term abstinence, to move away from something, to hold back from something. If it ends in able, it means capable, viable. Via means life, able, capable, capable of living, right? capable of life, viable. All you need to know is that able means capable. If it ends in ac, it means pertaining to, cardiac, pertaining to the heart. Acetabel, strange little word. We'll see this term used when we get to the bones in about three or four weeks. It literally means vinegar cup. If you've taken a little bit of chemistry, you know that vinegar is also called acetic acid or vice versa. Acetic acid is called, weak acetic acid is called vinegar. So you see the acetyl in there. And then you also see the kind of a table word in there in the acetabel. And this term, uh, strangely enough, means vinegar cup. Your hip socket is referred to as the acetabulum. And it strangely reminded the Romans of a little vinegar cup that they would tempt, uh, usually have at their table for uh, cleansing and for spicing up food. 
It's a weird little word. Just know acetabulum means vinegar cup. You'll be good. <laughs> Acro, extremity. Shrek, right? Andre the Giant and Shrek have this weird condition called acromegaly. They have enlargement of their extremities, right? The big face, the big hands. Acro means extreme at extremity. Megaly means enlargement. Okay, so again, don't worry about this, acromegaly, but if that makes sense to you, fantastic, it'll help you. Just know acro means extremity. A coup, like acoustics, hearing. A dip, adipose, another word for fat. AD, to or toward or near. There's a movement called adduction, adduction or adduction, and that is moving toward the midline. So as I move my arm down, this is adduction. It's coming toward the center. We'll talk about these terms in lab later on. Adeno, gland. Aero, air or oxygen. If it ends in AL, it's like ac, another term meaning pertaining to. AF is toward. We're going to see this term afferent. I'm going to say afferent just to overemphasize it. Most people would just say afferent. But afferent meaning toward. It's going toward something. We'll talk about this when we get to the nervous system. And LB, think albino, white. Lastly for today, aliment, nourishment. Your digestive system, your, your digestive system is sometimes called the alimentary canal. It's the way by which we get nutrients. Algia, a painful condition. Alveol, a small hollow hole or sinus or section. Now, you may have heard about the alveoli, the little air sacs of your lung, but your tooth fits into a space in your jaw called the alveolus. So again, the idea of a, of a space, okay, alveolus. And then ambi, both, like think ambidextrous. Now, on the first exam, I might ask you something like, well, you know your vocab, so what does ambialgia mean? Pain on both sides. Pain on both sides, okay? That's kind of how I'll approach this. I will take these prefixes, right? Just like you're going to take your note cards, and you're just going to line them up on your page, and you're going to say, what kind of crazy combination can Matt come up with this time, right? And kind of take some of the beginning and the ending and just put them together. Sometimes these words are in the dictionary. Sometimes they're not. <laughs> uh, honestly, I'm kind of strapped. I'm like, okay, let's throw, throw, throw those two words together. But ambialgia would kind of suggest what? Pain on both sides. You will know that because you will know ambi is both and algae is pain. Fair enough? That's how I want you to study this. Make up some note cards. I hope to see lots of note cards done and complete all the way through zero, okay, before we get together next time. Just go ahead and do it. It won't take you very long at all, okay? Put a little rubber band around them, stick them in your purse or your backpack. When you're at the traffic light, pull them out. You have cards, I took Chinese a couple years ago. Every time I got to a tra traffic light, I was looking at characters, trying to learn them. So I, I've done it, been there, done that. Okay, so that's our vocab, guys, and we'll just continue working through that list day after day after day. So what questions do you have for me? Anything at all about vocab? Okay, so first exam, slides 1 through 16. Shall we get started? Keep going? Go past all the um, vocabulary slides, and you'll get over to lab or lecture 1, chapter 1. Let's look at these PowerPoint slides together. Okay. So you're in this course called Anatomy and Physiology. What in the world are we in for, and what do these words mean? Let's just get started right there. So anatomy really is the study of structure. How, you know, how do these things go together? What's the name of everything? It comes from the Greek meaning to cut up, right, or to cut open, to dissect, to open up, to view. Okay, and for years, historically, that's how we've learned about the body. Med students still use donor cadavers to learn about anatomy, to learn about the interaction of one structure with another. Okay? We also have some beautiful online and virtual resources available to us now. But that's historically how we did this. Then there's this other side called physiology. Physiology is, well, once I know all the parts, how do they all go together and what do they do? It is the active side of everything. It's, it's really understanding the function of these structures. Your body is divided up into 11 different body systems, 12 if you count the two reproductive systems as being separate, 
And we'll be talking about those body systems. You'll see them in lab. You'll have a little quiz over them. You'll, you'll be doing some pre-lab activities on them. And it's really, really hard to have anatomy separate from physiology. It's not impossible, but it sure is boring. Nothing is more boring, I think, than just a pure anatomy lab. Just name that, name that, name that, name that, name that, name that. There's a time and a purpose for that. But it's also really more interesting when you figure out how do all those pieces go together. So if this was an anatomy class, if I had a bicycle in front of me, the anatomy portion of that would be labeling the, you know, the pedal and the gears and the handlebars and the seat and all the parts, right? And then the physiology side of it would be, OK, how does one get on this instrument? How does one pedal? How does one move forward? What are the aerodynamics of all that? So you would first learn the parts, and then you would learn about how it all goes together. Now, I'm not going to ask you to know these uh, historical figures, but you'll recognize Aristotle, right? If I ever go on Jeopardy, Aristotle's going to be my answer for many things. He seemed to have his finger in many, many activities. But long, long ago, Aristotle wrote a book of parts of animals. I read this book in high school. I remember reading this book. It's a really short little book in my Western Civ course. And it basically, in one part, Aristotle argued that as complex structures as complex beings, you and me, that we are actually made up of more simple pieces that are the building blocks. Well, that's exactly how we're going to approach this first chapter. We're going to appreciate that we are a body, but we have 11 systems, and then those systems are made up of smaller parts, and we're going to backtrack this thing to some very small pieces. Then there was Herophilus, again, a guy of antiquity. Um, they, they used to dissect human cadavers as public demonstrations. Can you imagine? Maybe you can, can't. The heat of Greece in the summertime, I'm picturing flies, right? Lots of smell and gore. But that's how we learned, right? There were public demonstrations of the human body. It was an incredible, rich way of learning. Not exactly you know, the most pleasant, but very important for our learning about the body. And that information kind of hung around all the way up until the Renaissance, up until the, the Enlightening, because there was a time uh, during, um, right after, uh, in the early AD years, that dissection, at least in the Western world, were banned. Okay, So we learned at this point, from the time of the ancients, there was this big dark period. Right, We've heard about the Dark Ages, if you will. And during this period, there wasn't a whole lot of human cadaver work being done, at least not in the Western world. And we started to learn a lot about our body from animals. Well, in a few weeks when we do fetal pig dissections, you're going to see that the pig is a wonderful, similar mammal. Right? There are a lot of things similar about the pig to us. But there are some things that are vastly different. And if we depended completely upon animals to know about human anatomy, we would have some real short uh, coming. So it's important that um, then when we get along to uh, the Renaissance and to the re lightning again, we started using um, cadavers again. Anatomy is still an area of research. There are still many hundreds of university anatomy departments who are still actively doing research on anatomy. So you would think we've got this all figured out. We don't. There are still cells in the body. We don't know what they do. There are still chemicals and interactions in our body that we really are not sure about. So there is still an awful lot to learn about. The other guy who's going to be my first answer on Jeopardy is going to be Da Vinci, right? So it's going to be Aristotle or Da Vinci. And here are some beautiful drawings. You've probably seen this Vitruvian man drawing before, an incredible artist. He drew some incredibly correct and, and detailed anatomical images. I've got a link here. I haven't checked it in the last year, but I think it's still valid. Just some beautiful uh, illustrations. Don't feel obligated to go there. But if you're really intrigued by just some beautiful drawings, uh, check that out. Vesalius, also finishing this up, uh, came along and started promoting the idea of living anatomy again, started using cadavers and autopsies for learning about the human. So that's kind of a quick historical lesson. I'm not going to ask you about the years. I'm not going to ask you about the guys. I just want you to realize that this has been an area of interest for years, right? thousands of years. People have been learning about our body and we're still in the active uh, stage of learning about our anatomy and our physiology. So let's begin by describing these two terms, microscopic versus macroscopic. Okay, Microscopic versus macroscopic anatomy. Pretty easy. Microscopic, what you need a microscope for, things that are too small to see with the naked eye. Macroscopic, those things which we can see 
with the naked eye. In the microscopic world, there's two terms I want you to know, cytology. Cytology, ology means the study of cytocell. So the study of cells. And we'll be looking at some cells starting next week in lab, lab two. And we'll see some, we'll see sperm. We're going to see different cells throughout the semester. We're also going to be looking at histology. Histology is a study of tissues. We're going to be looking at muscle tissue and nervous tissue and connective tissue. And we're going to spend all of lab three looking through the microscope of different tissues. And we'll be using that information all the way through 105 and into 106. Then what you can see with the naked, right, with the naked eye, that's gross anatomy. So every year I help out with the first year medical students at MSU and then gross anatomy lab. You know, we're in the lab, we've got 50 cadavers around us. We're not looking through microscopes, we're just looking at anatomy, looking at gross anatomy. So here's the hierarchy that, uh, that uh, Aristotle mentioned. He said that complex things are made up of less complex things. And this is the hierarchy that I need you to appreciate. This is the way that the book is arranged. This is the way that the lab is arranged. So let's kind of work through this, OK? Um, so starting next time, I'm going to be talking about atoms and molecules. Atoms and molecules, the smallest, they're not the smallest. We now have smaller things. But they're as small as we're going to go in this course. You've got a periodic table over here in the front of the room. You're not going to be learning about that in this class, maybe in a chemistry class in the future. But we have things like carbon and oxygen and nitrogen. And, and uh, those are the atoms. And those atoms can combine to make molecules. Think H2O, water, or CO2, or even glucose. And then those molecules are very important in the building blocks to make cells. There's a couple big steps missing in here that I'll go back to in a few minutes. Oh, is it the organelles? Yeah. Different? Yeah, I'm missing, uh, I'm missing actually two levels in between there. In a moment, I'm going to fill in those blanks. OK, so hold on there. Uh, but thank you for saying that. So there's a big jump. That's a big arrow. That's a big jump from molecules to cells. In our body, there's about 250 or so different kinds of cells. And those 250 different kinds of cells are going to combine into tissues, right? Things like muscle tissue, nervous tissue, connective tissue, epithelial tissue. We'll talk all about these things. Those different tissues then combine to make the organs, heart, liver, kidney, brain. Those organs then combine in, in different ways to make the systems, right? So the digestive system. Um, let's, let's work backwards then. So we've got our whole body. The body is made up of many systems. The digestive system is one of them, right? That's our system. The digestive system is made up of many organs. The intestines are part of that. If I looked under the microscope at the intestines, as you will next couple weeks, we'll see that there are cell or tissues that make up those intestines. And then from that, there are cells that make that up. And from that, we know that there are molecules and atoms. So I want you to know this hierarchy, front and, uh, forward and backwards. I call this the atom to atom. Okay, So I call this the atom to atom continuum. Okay, And it kind of sets up the way our course is set up. Okay, Atom to atom. So let's go through that. I've got about seven or eight minutes. Let me get through. I think I can get through most of this uh, hierarchy kind of story. I've got about one slide or so per level, just to fill this in a little bit more completely. So we're going to start off with the simplest level, and that's back at the atom. OK, so here's the periodic table. You see it on the screen. You don't need to memorize anything about that, but you've seen something like that. And on here are things like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. Each of these boxes represents a different atom, a different uh, element on our Earth. So that's where we're going to start the whole story. And those things like carbon and oxygen and nitrogen are now the important building blocks for making molecules. So we get to molecules. Molecules, things like water, right? H2O. H2O tells me that it's one oxygen and two hydrogens that are hanging out together. We'll talk more about that next time. Or even things like vitamins or sugars, those are all molecules. Now, one of the levels that I skipped over in that first picture is that molecules, basic molecules, simple molecules, then combine to make larger molecules that are most often referred to as macromolecules. Macro means large. So these are the large molecules. And 
these macromolecules come in four basic groups. I'm going to go ahead and introduce that to you now so that when you come across it again, you'll say, okay, I've seen that before. So there are four different types of four different types of macromolecules. You may know what those are. What are the four basic types of macromolecules? Number one, any order? Yeah, the carbohydrates. And under that, there are sugars. And we're going to break this down in far greater detail next time. But I'm just kind of getting us an idea. So we have carbohydrates. What else do you find in your food label? Lipids. Yeah, lipids, fats. OK, we'll talk about that next time. That's one category. Protein. Yeah, proteins. Those three we find in our food label, don't we? What else? One more. What else? One more group of molecules. They're not on our food label. They don't give us any Glucose. nutritional information. That's a sugar, a carbohydrate. But we eat it every day. Uh, Nucleic acids, your DNA and RNA. OK, do we eat that stuff? Absolutely. Every time we eat anything, we're eating cells, and that contains DNA and RNA. But we don't get any nutritional information from it, so it's not in our food labels. Those are our four macromolecules. And we're going to, again, next lecture, we're going to break this down a little bit more, just kind of getting us through the introduction. Those macromolecules are then the building blocks of the other thing that was missing from that atom to atom ch uh, chart, and those are the organelles. The organelles, things like the Golgi apparatus, the endoplasmic reticulum, the nucleus, the cell membrane, the um, um, lysosomes. These are all different organelles, basically little working parts of a cell. We'll talk more about those in chapter two and three. These organelles then are the building blocks of cells. Okay? So cells are the fundamental living thing. They're the smallest thing that we consider living in our body. We have trillions of cells making up our body. Okay? The cells then combine in unique ways to make tissues. Now, we're going to be looking at a number of different tissues this semester, but tissues come in four groups, four basic groups. And they're all here for you. Let's go through these quickly. More on these next time. Four types of tissues. Number one, connective tissues. These tissues, as the name suggests, somehow connect, bind us together. Uh, under this category would be bone, cartilage. Even blood is a connective tissue. Fat is a connective tissue. We'll be looking at each of these under the microscope, learning what they look like. These are connective tissues. Then there are, there's muscle tissue. Right? There's three different kinds of muscle tissue. We'll be looking at those individually as well. Right now, don't worry about it. Just kind of recognize, OK, muscle tissue is another type of tissue. Muscle tissue is unique in that it moves, right? It creates movement in our body. Then there's epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is the kind of tissue that's going to cover us, like our skin. Our outer layer of our skin is epithelial, or it's going to line our organs. Those who were um, in lab, you're going to hear about serous membranes. That's all epithelial. You'll hear about that coming up. And then there's nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is special in that it can conduct electrical signals very, very quickly through your body. So we have four different kinds of tissues, uh, four basic groups, connective, muscle, epithelial, and nervous. Those tissues then combine to make organs, right? So if I had a heart in my hand, in that heart, in that organ, I would find some muscle, some connective, some epithelial, and some nervous tissue that had combined in a unique way to make a heart. If I had a liver in my hand, likewise, I could find representatives of all those tissue types within that liver or within a brain, OK? Now, these organs combine in unique ways to make the organ systems, the 11 different systems. And then they combine to make you and me as a holistic individual. Now, I'm going to flash through these really, really fast, because this is something you're going to be doing in lab. Oh, this is something you're going to be doing in your pre-lab. And when I flash through these, I'm not going to read through everything here. I need you to be able to do three things for me when you see these pictures. Number one, recognize it. 
Recognize the system. Know its name. Number two, know major organs that make up the system. And number three, know some of the functions of these systems. On the exam, I'm not going to say, question number 17, list the five functions of the integumentary system. It's not the way the exams are going to be. The exam would instead be, which of the following is not a function of the integumentary system? Or which of the following is a function of the integumentary system? So it's more recognition than it is being able to write out all of the functions of the systems. And so I'm just going to go through this very, very quickly because you're going to see this again as you do your pre-lab and lab stuff. So we see this, we think integumentary system, skin, hair, nails, and it's going to be uh, preventing water loss and vitamin D synthesis. Now, I'm over time, aren't I? So here's what I want you to do. We'll pick up with these systems. Very simple. You need to be able to recognize them. And then we'll finish up with chapter one. It's going to take us about 15 minutes at most when we get together again on Wednesday. Then I'll get started in chapter two. And as the syllabus says, I won't quite finish chapter two, and I'll finish it the following, probably online, right? That'll be our online lecture that we'll be listening to together. So hang in there. Come see me if you have any concerns. Email me if you have any concerns. And I look forward to seeing you all again on Wednesday.